Hello everyone and welcome to our uh, live stream uh, for this uh, Saturday. We are, uh, this is True Crime Man's Dark Imagination and I'm your host Alan Gotro. and if this is your first time here, please hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so that you'll be notified of future episodes. In this episode, in the 1990s, a collector of Jack the Ripper memorabilia bid on a series of letters being liquidated at an auction from the owner of an antiquarian bookshop. The owner of the bookshop set about to retire and found the dusty pile of papers in his collection and decided that they may be valuable to someone. Little did he know that the collector recognized that one of the letters actually named history's most elusive killer, and he set about on a search of the named suspect's history and past discovering why he had been named as a viable suspect in the first place. In 1888, in London's Whitechapel district, the inhabitants reeled from the recent series of murders attributed to an assailant referred throughout history as Jack the Ripper. Many suspects came to the forefront as it seemed and as time went on, the list grew substantially. Originally, there were five murders in Whitechapel that historians and criminologists have referred to as the canonical five. But since the murders occurred, there have been other murders before the originals and after the last canonical that have been attributed to this most elusive killer. Over time, there have been several theories that frankly seem more ludicrous and fabricated to fit the evidence rather than pointing to a viable suspect. Of the many that have made sense, one in particular drew close attention from those who have studied the case very closely. This suspect in the world's most famous serial killings gained notoriety after a letter was discovered at an auction in 1993. Stuart Evans, a now retired British policeman, acquired a letter written by the former head of the special branch at Scotland Yard, one John G. Littlechild. In the letter composed by Littlechild, in September of 1913, a full 25 years after the murders, the inspector responded to a query put forth to him by a journalist named George R. Sims regarding suspects in the murders. Little Child, although he was not directly involved with the case at the time, but knew the investigators, named a suspect that had never really been researched before, a quack doctor named Tumblety from America. Little Child wrote, I never heard of a Dr. D in connection with the Whitechapel murders, but amongst the suspects, and to my mind a very likely one, was a Dr. T which sounds very much like D. He was an American quack named Tumblety and was at one time a frequent visitor to London, and on these occasions brought under the notice of police, there being a larger dossier concerning him at Scotland Yard. Although a psychopathosexual a subject, he was not known as a sadist, which the murderer unquestionably was. But his feelings towards women were remarkable and bitter in the extreme, a fact on record. Born in Ireland in 1833, Francis Tumblety's family moved to the United States sometime around 1847 and settled in Rochester, New York. This journey took place during the Irish Potato Famine, where many Irish families moved away from the starvation occurring in their homeland. Nothing much is known of Tumblety's childhood, but as a teenager, he began working as a steward for a doctor who proclaimed himself an expert on French cures of sexual diseases. Tumblety also tried to sell rudimentary pornography to all the boatmen that would frequent the pubs around the Erie Canal. One of these boatmen described the young man as a dirty, awkward, ignorant, uncared-for, good-for-nothing boy, utterly devoid of education. 
Tumblety then went to work at Dr. Lispinard's Hospital in Rochester, where he specialized in treating ailments that were particular to women. He performed hysterectomies and treated the problems of youth, mainly venereal diseases. Soon after Tumblety gained a little notoriety with his dirty wares, a man named Rudolph Lyons set up a temporary office in Rochester where he sold patent medicines that seemed to cure, according to Lyons, everything from pimples to cancer. Tumblety adopted this form of trade and later started his own business with the same plan in Detroit, Michigan in 1855. Tumblety knew he needed a gimmick and called himself a full-fledged Indian herb doctor. He also continued to sell the French cures for the sexual diseases as well. Tumblety knew he had to give his business some credibility and stated that he earned a medical degree from a medical school, a claim that proved untrue. Although a blatant lie, Tumblety began signing his name with an MD at the end. He traveled extensively and in 1857 he landed in Toronto where he had been arrested by a detective Samard for attempting to perform an abortion on a 17-year-old prostitute, Philomene Dumas. His lawyers maintained that the prostitute manufactured the case against him and authorities released him, although they knew his reputation as an illegal abortionist. Whenever Tumblety made his way to a new town, he would enter as if he were the featured member of a circus. His entourage included a valet and two dogs which followed closely behind him. This lifestyle seemed to suit Tumblety, but the haphazard way with which he used to conduct his businesses ran afoul of the law on more than one occasion. He later opened an office in New York and later worked in Jersey City, Pittsburgh, and then many western cities such as San Francisco. As is true with most charlatans, Tumblety was always on the move, where he traveled from Detroit through Toronto and eventually made his way to St. John, Brunswick in 1860. There, a patient in his care, one named Portmore, died. An inquest discovered that Tumblety had been guilty of manslaughter. After his release, authorities never saw the wily Tumblety again as he fled on one stormy night. From St. John, Tumblety arrived in Boston, Massachusetts, where his extravagant lifestyle made sure that his name appeared in the newspapers every day as his advertisements would attract those seriously seeking medical assistance with whatever ailment may have plagued them at the time. The doctor was very flamboyant with his appearance and was not shy with exhibiting his proclivities to the male of the species. Obviously, what he peddled seemed to work because Tumblety registered incomes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars over successive years. At the start of the American Civil War, Tumblety settled in Washington, D.C., where he obtained a military uniform and claimed to be a member of General George B. McClellan's staff, the commander of the Union Army at the time. Tumblety became acquainted with several of the general's staff, and one man in particular, Colonel C.A. Dunham, had been interviewed some time later when he became a successful lawyer based in New York City. Colonel Dunham stated that he attended a party on one occasion at Tumblety's apartments in Washington. Dunham thought it odd that no females appeared at the gathering. When Dunham queried his host, Tumblety launched into a homily against womankind, especially fallen women. In fact, as reported in the San Francisco Examiner that he had all the instincts of a certain brutal and degraded class of debauchees and hated them with a hatred that he never lost the opportunity of showing. Dunham then told of Tumblety's specimen collection that he seemed very proud to display to his guests. In one of the side rooms from where the party had been conducted, Dunham noticed approximately a dozen jars that Tumblety claimed contained the wounds of every class of women. Tumblety then related a story about his love for an older woman. She flirted heavily with him and kissed him and called him a dear jealous fool. Tumblety later discovered the woman to be a prostitute and that she saw other men. Dunham stated that Tumblety then gave up on all womankind. Some historians surmised that because of being jilted and the Montreal abortion case, this provided Tumblety with a case for the hatred for women. 
Not to be outdone internationally with his quackery, Tumblety made his way to England in July of 1888, one month before the start of the Ripper murders. The doctor knew London very well and traveling to England and staying for months at a time. By 1888, Tumblety's flamboyance tamed somewhat and he began dressing more somberly and wore a dark Ulster coat and a derby hat. By this time, Tumblety was 55 years old. On August 31, 1888, police found the body of Mary Ann Nichols. On the 8th of September, the body of Annie Chapman with her corpse mutilated and her womb missing. And on September 30th, the bodies of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, the famous double event, Eddowes had her womb and her left kidney missing. Newspapers ran stories that there were strong rumors that the Ripper was an American doctor who fled in early October from his lodgings in the vicinity of the murders after his landlady found blood on one of his shirts. The authorities then surveyed the lodgings and at the port of Liverpool in the belief that the killer might try to sail to America. On November 7, 1888, police arrested Tumblety for gross indecency with another man. Unfortunately, this was a misdemeanor and the police could not hold him for more than 24 hours. Mary Jane Kelly was murdered in the early morning hours of November 9, 1888. The police then issued a warrant on November 14th for Tumblety's arrest, charging him with four counts of gross indecency with four different men, Albert Fisher, Arthur Bryce, James Crowley, and John Doughty. He appeared in the Magistrate Court of Marlborough Street on November 16th. Despite the suspicions of authorities, they had no evidence that would have connected Tumblety with the Whitechapel murders. The assistant commissioner in charge of detectives at Scotland Yard communicated with the chief of police in San Francisco to obtain Tumblety's handwriting samples. Subsequent to the issuance of the warrant on the charges of gross indecency, Tumblety fled to Boulogne, then Le Havre, then traveled to New York on the steamer Le Bretain, where he allegedly landed on December 2nd, as reported in U.S. newspapers. Newspapers in New York carried the story of Tumblety's escape and described how Scotland Yard suspected the quack of being Jack the Ripper. In fact, news of those suspicions reached the United States and appeared the accusations and suspicions followed Tumblety with a vengeance. Some of them reported that Tumblety had been arrested on suspicion of being the Whitechapel murderer until later corrections appeared as to the true charges. As much as the press and the police tried to candy coat it, Tumblety was a homosexual, or at the very least, bisexual. There are stories that in every city he visited, he sought out the company of young men. Since he hated women, as per the newspaper articles, arrest reports from London, and the stories that have been passed down through the decades, it is highly doubtful that Tumblety would have murdered women so savagely as has been reported. However, there are exceptions to the rules. The victims exhibited no real signs of sexual activity. Despite the suspicions that followed Tumblety, he died of a heart attack in St. John's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri on May 28, 1903. Among his personal possessions when he died were $432.70 in cash, a $1,000 railway bond, a 17-diamond cluster ring valued at $75, a 5-diamond ring valued at $60, a $10 gold watch, and something more valuable to ripperologists, two imitation rings worth $3. Why is this important? One of the ripper victims, Annie Chapman, had missing from her person two cheap brass rings that she wore constantly. Does this prove that perhaps Tumblety was Jack the Ripper? Well, these rings could have been purchased anywhere at the time for a very inexpensive price. Could they have been the missing Chapman rings? Certainly, but there is very little corroborating evidence that they actually did belong to the Ripper victim. What historians, criminologists, Ripperologists, and amateur sleuths are left with is the history of circumstance that could or could not point the incriminating finger toward Francis Tumblety as being the most sought-after serial killer 
in human history. Although there is no exculpatory evidence to bring Tumblety to an historical verdict as being Jack the Ripper, the mystery continues. Of all the suspects that have been listed in all the books that are published every year, it seems that Tumblety stands out as the ideal candidate for the elusive serial killer. But as with all circumstances that present this particular suspect, for instance, the arrests for gross indecency coincide with the murders. What would be interesting would be to see what other arrests of other suspects may have occurred with that particular chronological pattern. In addition, the lodging house proprietor who reported that she found a case with bloody clothing and certain pornographic material stated that her residence was located on Batty Street, right in the heart of the Whitechapel District. It has not been ascertained as to whether the case belonged to Tumblety or not. Did Tumblety match the various descriptions given of the men seen with the victims prior to their murders? He may have been too tall and dressed too stylish to match those descriptions. But that would be an interesting research avenue. I know this episode was a little bit short, but uh, there's not a lot out there on Francis Tumblety. Uh, but we're probably going to be covering a lot of other suspects that may pop up, like James Kelly and... Uh, the, the gentleman that was with Mary Kelly the night that she died. What we see here is probably, and I, I mentioned this before because we did an episode on Jack the Ripper where we listed a number of suspects, is that I'm not quite sure we're ever going to find out who it is um, without uh, proper uh, forensic investigation uh, unless there is a another diary somewhere, which is very interesting because... When this letter came out, the diary of Jack the Ripper was published, and that was later uh, determined to be uh, a, not a forgery, but it wasn't authentic uh, per se. James Maybrick was named as the as the Ripper in that one. Um, this case continues to fascinate people. Uh, we did one on the Royal Conspiracy, which was presented by um, Stephen Knight, and Stephen Knight later on said that you know it was proven wrong. Um, we have Patricia Cornwall and her ridiculousness uh, tearing up uh, paintings to find uh, messages that uh, Walter Sickert was Jack the Ripper. I don't believe we're looking for someone who would wear a top hat and a tuxedo and a cape in that part of town. It would have to be somebody that blended in, uh, specifically Aaron Kosminski or James Kelly. James Kelly was in an insane asylum when he uh, escaped abruptly. But... I felt that uh, Francis Tumblety was interesting because of his colorfulness, his uh, flamboyance. Um, if you have any opinions, please leave them in the comments below. Uh, more episodes will be um, uh, done on uh, other suspects. We have a lot of uh, shows coming up. Uh, with the end of the year coming, I'm going to try and do two a, two a month. Uh, which will be uh, more than enough. Uh, I like these live streams because because basically it's less work. Um, let me turn this down a little bit. I'm, I think I'm yelling in the microphone a little bit. Okay. So it's it's kind of less work because I do the intros and the conclusions live, and then that way I don't have to put the whole video together, but I might do that. I may have enough for another marathon, oh, maybe around March or April of next year. So this one, this one, like I said, was kind of short. I mean, we're, we're going on 19 minutes. Um, I love to see every, Oh, hello, junior. How are you? Uh, love to see everybody coming in. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of, uh, viewers that, uh, watch it live, but there are some that, uh, make comments and, and watch it later on. Um, I wanted it to be as concise as possible with all the superfluous, uh, research, was Tumblety the Ripper? He could have been. Uh, anybody could have been. George Chapman could have been. Uh, the Duke of Clarence could have been, certainly. Uh, but it was proven that uh, through the court circulars that the Duke of Clarence, Prince Eddie, was nowhere near the murders. He was in Scotland uh, during that time. What type of person are we looking for? Someone who would have blended in in Whitechapel. Whitechapel was the uh, poorest district that had ever been 
in in London, and of course they had an influx of a lot of immigrants coming from Europe, trying to uh, mostly Jews escape the pogroms, the um, uh, what they call uh, de facto uh, anti-Semitism, and then later on de jure anti-Semitism uh, anti-Semitism that occurred. Um, I hope you like our shows. Uh, the last one, uh, Halloween, was pretty was pretty good. I like doing that one the, on the Salem witch trial. It, it was it was a lot of fun. The research was it was all there. Okay, uh, Tumble Tea, <clears throat> excuse me, not a lot, um, thank you, Jay, I appreciate it, not a lot for, um, uh, as far as, I don't understand how a lot of historians can write books with not a lot of research material, um, you know, to me, in some instances, it would be conjecture. Now, what I would like to do, because I know this is going to replay, is uh, I'm looking for subscribers that would like to narrate an episode, I'd like to really get a guest host, but... Uh, those who want to narrate an episode or certain portions of it, uh, if you're interested or know anybody that may be interested, uh, please, you know, contact me at true crime. I'm sorry. Yeah. True crime MDI at gmail.com. And, uh, and we'll see what we can do. I'll send them, I'll send them a short script. They can send it to me. They don't have to be perfect. Okay. They don't have to be a perfect narrator. They don't have to be a radio announcer, just somebody that can read. Also, I'm, you know, I'm going to hawk my books here, you know, uh, Dark Bayou, Infamous Louisiana Homicides, and Bloodstained Louisiana, 12 Murder Cases, 1896 to 1934. Dark Bayou's been getting a lot of um, attention lately. Um, about three weeks ago, I did an interview with the True Crime Network on a story that was in here, and uh, that should be airing next summer, and I'm doing another interview for a podcast in January about another story that was that was in this book. So there. They're really getting a lot of uh, a lot of traction, you know. Well, let's see. Aresh says, I know the Ripper was not a resident of London, so every suspect sounds okay as long as they are not from London. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, why would you go somewhere where you'd be known? That makes a lot of sense. Um, as far as the victimology is concerned, I've heard some latest reports that not all of them were prostitutes, all right? But you've got some... Like before, you have uh, Martha Tabram, who was before the Canonical Five, and then you have Emma Smith, okay, and then you have Francis Coles, okay. So you've got as many uh, as uh, between seven and ten sus uh, uh, victims here. Uh, not all of them have that quite that signature. If you look at the Canonical Five, that well, the first four, you know, you've got Polly Ann Nichols, you've got Annie Chapman, you've got um, Elizabeth Stride, and you've got uh, Catherine Eddowes. They did not all sustain the same wounds. Uh, Mary Kelly, if you've ever seen the crime scene photo, which I did not show here, um, it's gruesome. Uh, somebody decided that they were going to colorize it and make it look like a, a normal crime scene photo. And that's actually quite gory and gross. Um, but it, it was a frenzy. It was a frenzied kill. And it was the first time he had ever murdered inside so he could take his time. Um, I kind of agree with the rest about, uh, if I'm saying that uh, um, correctly, I, I think it would have had to have been somebody who was not familiar in the Whitechapel District, therefore not London. So that would make a lot of sense. Now, again, I don't think he was wearing a top hat or a tuxedo or a cape. It had to be somebody that walked around unnoticed through Whitechapel. And, of course, I think Tumblety would have been um, – would have been noticed in Whitechapel. I, you know, I mean, he, well, first of all, he was flamboyant. When he went to London, he kind of calmed down his, his, uh, uh, his wardrobe a little bit. Um, again, you know, it's not holding anything against him. The man was a homosexual. Um, you know, he'd been arrested for gross indecency wherever he went. Uh, he would find young men that, uh, that would, uh, he would keep company with, so to speak. And um, did it make him, did he hate women that much that he would have to, that he would do what he did, what Jack the Ripper did? Possibly. Possibly. And the arrests coincide with his, uh, with the murders. I'd have to, I'd have to look at his history a little bit more. I'm not an expert. Uh, I'd love to get a professional profiler to take a look at it. Uh, let's see. Daniel Webster says, uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, I think Francis Tumblety enjoyed the notoriety of being a suspect, but I can't see him walking around the East End dressed like that. That that would be, uh, I would have to agree with that because, like I said, he was flamboyant wherever he went. He had to be noticed. 
Uh, he made hundreds of thousands of dollars selling basically snake oil. Um, pimple cream to cancer is what he said it cured. Uh, they were in for a lot of those. Uh, they had a lot of those charlatans around at that time, especially in, uh, in the United States. Uh, Daniel also says the police officer got the best look at the Ripper, and he said, uh, I was sorely tempted to stop him, but there was police reform about us stopping citizens. The man had a melancholy voice. Now, how do you describe a melancholy voice? Do you describe, is it, is it more effeminate, or is it um, uh, something that sounds sad or depressed? It's kind of hard to define it that way. Uh, but I kind of agree uh, with Aresh about the person that was Jack the Ripper was not a, uh, a resident of London. Again, you know, it would be recognized. If you look, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of serial killers stay in their neighbor, in basically their neighborhoods or their areas. Um, they are recognized, but they don't draw much attention to themselves when they're out in public. Uh, could that have been him? Of course it could have been. Um one uh, person, a guy by the name of Donald Rumbelow, who uh, wrote a book called The Complete Jack the Ripper Casebook, and he leads tours of, of, the, of the crime scenes in London, said that the women basically contributed to their own demise. I don't know if I agree with that or not. I mean, they were trying to make a living. Things were rough, you know. And uh, he also said that uh, a lot of people that he had spoken to during... Um, this particular period of English history, they were not ashamed if old grandmama had to go stomp in the streets for money. You know, it, it was something that had to be done or something that was done. Uh, seconds after the man come walking out of the alley and shocked to see a police officer, seconds after that they found a woman butchered. He ran ahead trying to catch the man, but to no avail. Um, would it have been somebody who was familiar with the area? I'm going to say, yeah. I mean, he ducked in and out of those alleyways. Uh, a lot of those alleyways don't exist today. Uh, some do. I know Miller's Court was de uh, demolished in order to make room for a parking garage or something like that. And there's one mortuary that's still there that was used to uh, identify one, of the, uh, one or two of the victims that's still there. I'm trying to remember the name of the street. Marlborough Street uh, in London. I have never been. I've always wanted to go because now I hear they have a uh, Jack the Ripper museum and feminists tried to shut it down. Um, it's, it's in the area. It, it actually has, you know, they have a display in there, uh, Jack the Ripper's bedroom. I don't know how they would know uh, who, who, who that would be. As far as suspects are concerned, I've heard uh, there's a guy by the name of Rosalind Dunstan. Um, and uh, even the most infamous, I think, is Aleister Crowley. Uh, Alistair Crowley was a very evil man. I'm not sure if he was capable of murder. I know he performed a lot of um, rituals because he was a Satanist, uh, uh, end of the world type of person. Um, they pointed to a guy by the name of Charles Cross uh, who uh, had discovered one of the bodies very quickly. And, uh, you know, has anybody ever discounted that it could have been a policeman? And the reason why I bring that up is policemen would know where his fellow policemen were who were walking the beats, and he would know where to avoid them. Wouldn't that be possible? Uh, but, you know, the crime scene things, uh, the crime scene procedures and protocols back then were not what we would consider exactly sterile. Um, in fact, in one of them, they washed the blood off the street once they picked the victim up. Murders like these occurred in Whitechapel all the time. Well, murder, not murders like these, but murders occurred in Whitechapel uh, all the time. So um, Drew says, uh, I thought Walter Sickert was Jack the Ripper. Well, Patricia Cornwall spent a lot of her own money trying to prove that. And Walter Sickert comes into uh, the Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, with uh, that was written by Stephen Knight saying it was a Masonic type of conspiracy she tried to prove it i don't think she did uh she tore apart a lot of sickert's paintings with which were rare she bought them and then tore them apart and one person said who was an art collector he said this is rubbish basically is is what he said about her uh particular um uh 
way she was investigating. Uh, Drew says, uh, then, it, could it have been Aaron Kosminski? I think Aaron Kosminski is a good suspect. Uh, they also, also talk about a guy named Thomas Cutbush, uh, who could have been a suspect. He went around stabbing people in the behind, I think. And that's what made him one of the suspects for um, Scotland Yard. Uh, we're, we're not talking about dumb in investigators here. We're just talking about a cunning killer. And a cunning killer, um, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, after the canonical five were over, people kind of figured, well, the, the horror's over. Either he's dead or so. Oh, and Montague John Druitt, too, was another one. And I think I mentioned uh, James Maybrick. Uh, could it have been a woman? Could it have been a midwife? What would have been her motivation to do things like that? Um, Kosminski, his, uh, they interviewed his granddaughter, I think, in, in one of the, the documentaries that I watched. And they're all over uh, uh, YouTube, I'm sure, uh, because I've been watching a few of them. And um, she said she wouldn't have doubted that he was Jack the Ripper. Um, as far as the letter was concerned, yeah, he must have been very smart. Uh, well, cunning is the word that I would use, how to avoid being detected. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that I, I watched, uh, actually, you know, they named uh, a guy named uh, James Kelly. And James Kelly was in an insane asylum at the time, and then he escaped right before the first murder, uh, made his way to America. Now, in America, in New York in 1891, we had a Ripper-style murder in New York. Uh, Carrie Brown, who was known as Old Shakespeare, she was 60 years old. And they do have some surviving um, autopsy photos where it looked like perhaps she uh, she could have been a victim. Uh, they've also named a, a guy by the name of Flegelbaum, who was a German sailor, whose ships were uh, whose ships that he were on were in port in London at the time. Um, I'm sure you can make a case for any one of them. The problem is. There's a difference between what you know and what you can prove, all right? Uh, I'm not an expert investigator. I've never claimed to solve crimes. I Merely as an historian, I document them. But there's so many that could have been, they, uh, you know, and uh, the letters, the, uh, one, one thing I wanted to, 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 um, to cover. Um, it was discovered in 1931 that the Jack the Ripper letter was written by two enterprising journalists that wanted to drum up interest in the case and that's where they came up with jack the ripper because jack uh jack spratt you know high springs jack uh those were common colloquialisms used at the time so jack the ripper would have been uh would have been very uh popular also there were when we talk about the letters there were letters that had come as far away from australia now there were so many letters that were written and sent to news agencies and the police that one would think uh, Jack the Ripper spent all his time writing letters uh, rather than committing these, these horrendous crimes. Again, uh, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't discount um, people like um, the doctor, William Gull, uh, the Queen's surgeon. However, the year before the murder started, he had a stroke. Uh, they call it, uh, I think it was a, something, I'm, I'm trying to remember what they call it, a spasm of the brain is what they used to call it. And uh, he wasn't really strong, and he was 74 years old at the time. Now, he could have had help, okay? But he was the queen surgeon. He was uh, a surgeon per se, and he studied diseases of the mind. So was he studying himself? Uh, were they covering up for something? Who knows? Uh, like I said, it's it's a lot of conjecture. It's great because the um, the interest in the case seems to keep growing. But every year there are new books coming out naming the killer. And the thing is, I find that a lot of uh, people do um, is they take the evidence and they make sure that it fits with their suspect rather than seeing that their suspect fits with the evidence. You see, it's, it's kind of uh, backward as far as an investigation is concerned. And if you do it that way, anybody could be Jack the Ripper. Now, Drew asks, uh, oh, hello, uh, Jonathan. Hello from Sweden. How's Sweden doing? Is it doing all right? Is it getting colder over there or what? Um, okay, so the message was retracted. But um, I think, does he have medical knowledge? 
He had to have done some on Catherine. He had to have known some because Catherine Eddowes was operated in in the dark. And he didn't have a lot of time to take what he took. He took a kidney in, in her womb. Um, I think what connects Tumblety is about the wombs. Uh, there was a guy uh, that uh, came to London, allegedly, that was asking a hospital if they had any extra womb specimens because he collected them. Well, that could have been Tumblety. Um, uh, okay, so Drew asked, did Jack the Ripper get a thrill from the kills? Did he get a sexual thrill, an emotional thrill? What? Um Okay, I can say, based upon a lot of things that I have heard, that's okay, um, that I don't believe they were sexual killings. Um, I think they were more um, because of the simple fact that there was really no sexual assaults that occurred that would, um, other killers. And I'm, I'm, only, I'm only surmising here. An emotional thrill? I don't know. Uh, perhaps he just liked killing. Uh, there are people like that out there. Uh, and the question I have to ask was, uh, all the time, was this his first time doing it? Were the canonical five the first time he ever did that? Somebody that wields a knife like that, um, I don't think that was his first uh, uh, murder, uh, murders per se. Uh, there was one before that, Martha Tabram. Now, Martha Tabram had been stabbed repeatedly, not... Uh, cut and ripped uh, like the other ones. Uh, was it a hesitation type killing that most killers have? Um, uh, and, and I have to agree, he did probably, I'm not sure if it's a thrill or if it's satisfaction. Um, you know, there was no real evidence that it was anything sexual about it. Um, a lot of people have tried to make the point that the knife was a phallic symbol going into the females and things of that nature. I've heard a lot of people try to do that but um i think it was more of um a satisfaction of killing now what would be interesting is to find out other countries in europe that may have um you know he there may have been this may the 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 killings before may have been just a testing ground it would be interesting to find out if any of those occurred before in Europe somewhere. And then maybe we could draw some sort of some sort of base or foundation. Let's see. Jonathan says, cold and oh, cold and colder. You should do one on Olaf Palm, the Swedish prime minister shot to death during the 1970s. Okay. That sounds good. Could the Ripper be a woman? We had, we had uh, tried to discuss that. Um, does a woman need that much power? Uh, think about it. You know, a lot of these women had bruises on their throats first. I think the killer may have grabbed them by the throat first and then started cutting. It could be a woman, a big woman. All right. Most, a lot of midwives, I think a lot of the characterizations that we see of midwives back in the 19th century is that they are women of some stature and that they could have probably uh, pulled these uh, killings off. Um, you know, I'm going to keep doing this as long as uh, there's still, uh, you know, ripper material out there. New things will come up. Every once in a while, I'll read a book. But like I said, most, a lot of books come out every year about Jack the Ripper. I think at one time there were six books a year that came out. Um, I've never read uh, Patricia Cornwall's book on Walter Sickert, but uh, I have seen some reviews about it. And um, they're, they're not very likely. I like to find out for myself, uh, per se. Um, I read Stephen Knight's book. I've read books by Donald Rumbelo. Stuart Evans wrote a book on Tumblety, uh, where he named Tumblety. And, and he's actually, um, oh, that's interesting, Thomas D. Carr. I've never heard of him. Um, actually, our next episode has to do with the Civil War, American Civil War. Uh, and then we're going to move over to Europe, and then we'll move back to, over to the United States. Uh, it has to do with Andersonville, prisoner of war camp, and the execution of Henry Wirtz for war crimes. And there were crimes committed. So I'm going to have to look at that. Thomas D. Carr. I'm going to have to look at that one. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate it. Um, but uh, we have been, like I said, we have had a lot of trolls. And, uh, you know, the thing is, the, it's about them. It's not about the program or the channel. We're now up to uh, over 5,300 subscribers, and a lot of you have been with me since uh, since the beginning. I think the programs have gotten better. I like doing these live streams. They're really cool. 
Um, and it's, it's great when the technology works. So, um, what else did I want to say? Oh yeah. I want to reiterate about the, uh, excuse me, the subscribers. I'd like to get some subscribers interested in, uh, narrating some episodes, getting them interested in it and, and doing things like that. And then maybe coming up, suggesting ideas for scripts that they would want written for themselves to do. And I will put the videos together and, and we'll run them here on the channel. Um, again, you know, Dark Bayou, Infamous Louisiana Homicides, and Bloodstained Louisiana, 12 Murder Cases, 1896 to 1934. They're really good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not the best writer in the world. I, I fashion myself doing research. Uh, but they really came out uh, better than I expected. And in the next fall, there'll be a book out called Southern Evil, which will be about... Um, which will be about uh, crimes in the South uh, spreading out a little bit from Louisiana. I want to start branching out. So let's see. Who's that? Okay, so Champ Ferguson, who murdered 51 people. Okay, I'm going to have to look at that. Uh, Atlanta Ripper. Is it done or undergoing? Um, Atlanta Ripper was uh i have the book on it i wanted to do some research on it because there's a connection between the atlanta ripper and the murder of mary fagan which i had done an episode called murder of the innocents where uh we basically demonstrated that leo frank probably did not kill her but he was lynched for it and there's a connection in that case so the atlanta ripper would probably be a very good one and um probably take a lot of newspaper research which would which uh you know i can do newspaper research from home now uh here uh, i'm trying to work on another uh book uh that is a a military history book rather than a true crime book um uh, some people are saying, well, it's not you're not a true historian because all you do is you write about true crime. Well, that's not true. You have to do historical research to do that. So, Arash, thanks for the uh, suggestion. And uh, Drew, thanks for the suggestion. And again, if you all know anybody that might want to uh, narrate a particular episode, uh, episode in mind, please let me know. I mean, I can write the script, uh, but, you know, they got to know how to read, okay, and I can, and they have to have the equipment Bell Gunnis, we've all, I've already done Bell Gunnis, uh, William, under Ma Matron of the Boneyard. Uh, I'd, I'd already done an episode on her. Um, I'm trying to locate other Ripper murders that occurred in the United States after the initial uh, ones that occurred in London. Uh, I've been told that there are some that occurred, uh, specifically the one that Kerry Brown, the one that I, I spoke about. And um, I'd like to start interviewing people uh, on the show that uh, are uh, true crime authors or, or investigators or things of that nature. So if you know anybody that uh, would uh, like to do that also, uh, the subscriber thing was pretty interesting. And I, I came out with about three uh, narrators that were very good and I haven't, uh, I haven't heard from them in a while. So I thought maybe I would uh, go ahead and ask for that again possibly a guest host but they have to know how to record their voice they have to have certain uh you can get the equipment uh the, the software um well thank you very much arash I, arash I appreciate that where are you from initially by the way you can answer while i'm talking um well they uh no no thanks Jun uh, don't it's junior i I love them. I love doing the live streams. I got a lot of experience doing live streams uh, when we were in lockdown because I had to teach this way uh, on my personal channel. Uh, well, thank you very much. They, they, I, I surely uh, do try. You know, we try to make them better and better. Um, in fact, I'd like to get a better camera, uh, but this one seems to work out uh, correct. This microphone was actually only $36. And I uh, managed to dig out the garbage, a lot of things like lights and stuff. Uh, and lighting the green screen has been, been the most difficult. And, uh, you know, I let, uh, let my hair go back to its natural color. Um, but um, I, I, I enjoy doing them. They're, they're a lot of fun. I think they're educational. Um, some of them are kind of gory. But, uh, you know, 
It seems that people like that. They like the true crime. And if you notice, I'm not putting on any makeup while I'm doing it. <laughs> so I'm sorry. That was cast in shade. I'm sorry. Uh, but if you know anybody that wants to do these, wants to be a narrator, please you know, notify me. My email address is available on the channel. It's truecrimemdi at uh, gmail.com. We're also on uh, Buy Me a Cup of Coffee if you'd like to contribute. Um, uh, Peace just gave us $10 through the Super Chats, which is fantastic. And um, we're on, uh, we used to be on Subscribestar, but I felt I was robbing people because uh, not that many people were on there. I'm on Rumble. Uh, not a lot of uploads there. <clears throat> Excuse me, mostly here on uh, YouTube. We get the, uh, the uh, advertising a lot of times. And like I said, it's a lot of fun. It's re it really is a lot of fun. You know, I get a script written. I'm doing a, another one now, trying to get a couple more done before the end of the year. And uh, we have, oh, by the way, this is our 100th episode, by the way. This is our 100th episode. I'm so glad that we got to that. Um, and uh, Aran, okay. Okay. I think it's the first time I've, I've, I've had somebody uh, from Iran on here. I had a friend of mine used to live over there a long time ago. And uh, his father was with an oil company back in the 70s, and, and he lived there. Um, but uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy this, and I enjoy talking to people from all over the world. We have a lot, like I said, we have a lot of subscribers now. Um, you know, I do this because it's a lot of fun. I don't make any money, really, doing this. I think my last check was around $200, and that was after like five months but, uh, you know, I don't make a lot of money doing this, uh, mostly from my teaching. And uh, that's getting a little bit cramped uh, as we go. Now you find uh, differences in students, uh, people that want to learn, people that don't want to learn, people want things handed to them. And I'm the type of person that, you know, for education, I had to work very hard to get it, both my bachelor's and my master's degrees. So if you guys uh, don't have any other questions, um, I'll wait a second. Uh, we'll go into the end tag, but I want to remind you that we do have some uh, other episodes coming up. They're not going to stop. They're probably going to be a little bit better. Uh, I will look into that, Drew. That looks like a pretty interesting uh, topic. And uh, the Atlanta Ripper, William mentioned the Atlanta Ripper. I'm going to look in. Uh, uh... No, I haven't done. Let's see. He said, uh, Drew said, have you done a video on a serial killer from the American Revolution? No, I haven't heard of any, really. Um, if you get a line on something, send me an email and uh, and we'll see what we can do. But I want to head into this end tag. I don't want to keep you guys uh, for a long time. I've been talking for a good 20, 25 minutes. So um, if you have any other suggestions, let me know. Uh, if, recommend us to your friends. We're, we're really... Uh, Looking to, we hope to grow a little bit more. Uh, but like I said, this is our 100th episode, and I'm very happy that they've gotten a lot better over the years. We've been here four years. So, uh, you know, any friends that like true crime, send them our way, man. I'm, I'm sure they'll like what we're doing. Okay. So, uh, I'll see you guys next time. Uh, probably be, um, uh, okay, Drew. I'll see you next time. Uh, his phone's about to die. So, uh, but uh, we'll be around. We'll be around. Stay tuned for the next episode. And if you know anybody who wants to narrate, please uh, give them my email address and, uh, and steer them over to the channel, okay? Until next time.